Hi, I'm Dr. Evan Matthews. I'm here to do part three of the cardiovascular section. So part one was all about the anatomy of the heart, essentially. Part two was how cardiac output, heart rate, and stroke volume interact and what determines those, uh, the values for those. And part three here is going to be a lot about blood pressure and how blood flow works in the body. All right, so first let's talk about um, the cardiac cycle quickly. So the cardiac cycle can be split up into diastole and systole. All right, so diastole is the relaxation phase of the heart. This is the period of time where the left and right, the left and right uh, ventricle uh, relax, they dilate, uh, so they, they, they get bigger. And when they do that, they have a lower pressure inside. This kind of suction, this creates a suction that opens opens the AV valves between the ventricles in the bottom and the atriums in the top, and that causes blood to flow into the bottom chambers of the ventricles of the heart. All right, so that's all happening during uh, ventricular diastole. So that's, it's important to note that when I say diastole or systole and I don't specify which type, I'm talking about ventricular diastole and systole. All right, it's also atrial diastole and systole. They do not happen the same time as ventricular diastole and systole. All right, they happen uh, out of sync with each other. All right, so systole is when the um, contraction phase is of the left ventricle or of the ventricles. So if you think about this, uh, so this was when the blood was sucked in. Now the blood is already in the ventricles. The ventricles are big. They're filled with blood. And so now the ventricles are going to contract. This is going to force closed the two AV valves so that no blood can go back to the atriums. And it's going to force open the uh, the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve leaving the heart going towards the lungs and the uh, peripheral uh, circulatory system and it does so by increasing the pressure inside the ventricle again pushing back on these one-way valves that forces them to close and pushing on these uh, also one-way valves but going in the direction they're supposed to open causing them to open ejecting blood out of the heart all right so again diastole is the relaxation phase of the heart systole is the contraction so the work phase of the heart so when the ventricles contract, only about two-thirds of the blood actually exit the ventricles through the, um, the exiting valve, so the pulmonary and aortic valve. All right, so about one-third of the blood is left inside the ventricles, so you don't actually get all the blood out. You never will. It, no, at no point in time you get all the blood out. All right, so that's normal, though. Uh, it, that's essentially the ejection fraction that we're talking about. So there is a point where it's too low. Ejection fractions that are below around 50% or so are too low and that can happen with a lot of cardiac failure type uh, pathologies. Um, but again, normal ejection fraction is above 50%, somewhere around you know, 60, 70%, something like that. Um, and that is, again, just a normal, typical heartbeat. All right, so we talked about systole and diastole and exactly what they were. Um, so now let's talk about blood pressure. All right, so a, first off, a normal blood pressure is below 120 over below 80, and that's in millimeters of mercury. And this is typically measured in the brachial artery in the upper arm. All right, so um, if we stop for a second and ask what is that 120 and what is that 80, so the 120 is the systolic blood pressure, it's the higher number, the 80 is the diastolic blood pressure, it's always the lower number. And so basically what we're asking is what is the outward pressure, so what is the outward force that the blood is applying to the walls of the artery and specifically we're talking about the brachial artery so during the point in time when the left ventricle is contracted so when it's squeezing in on itself pushing the blood into the arteries of the body at that moment in time the blood uh, pushing out against the brachial artery has a force of less than 120 in a normal healthy person the diastolic blood pressure is the blood pressure at when the left ventricle is relaxed. So when the ventricle is not contracted, so when it's sort of dilated and it's pulling blood into itself, there's still pressure inside the artery. So there's still an outward force of the blood pushing against the walls of the brachial artery, and it should be below 80 millimeters of mercury at rest in a healthy individual. 
Pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. So let's say you had your blood pressure was exactly 120 over exactly 80. Your pulse pressure would be 40. All right, so the next uh, definition I want to quickly hit here is mean arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure is an attempt to get a time average mean of what the pressure is inside the artery. So it's not just averaging 120 and 80. So if you did that, you get 100. That's not mean arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure takes into consideration the approximate amount of time that you are in systole and the approximate amount of time that you're in diastole. So if you look at this electrocardiogram here, and if you don't remember what electrocardiogram is, go back and check out the section two of the cardiovascular uh, uh, slide sets that we already covered, um, where I briefly discuss um, all these waves here that make up the electrocardiogram. But anyway, so if we're looking at this, this red area here, this is systole. So it's everything from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. The rest of this here, um, from the end of the T wave, to the beginning of the next QRS complex, that is diastole. So we're talking ventricular systole, ventricular diastole. So notice it's about one third of the time that you're in systole and about two thirds of the time that you're in diastole. Right? Because of this, um, this normal relationship where it's one third and two thirds of the time, um, what we do is mean, we calculate mean arterial pressure as two thirds times diastolic blood pressure plus one third times systolic blood pressure. So again, that one third and two third uh, make it a somewhat of a time average mean. It's not a perfect measurement because in reality, we're not exactly two thirds and one third. Um, and this also changes when you go to exercise. So when you start to exercise, the distance between these two heartbeats is going to shorten, um, which means you're going to get a very shortened diastolic period. So mean arterial pressure is still calculated the same way, um, regardless of they're exercising or not. But it's not necessarily a, a good estimate of a t true time average mean during exercise. Um, again, because the di diastolic period shortens and it's much less than two thirds of the total cardiac cycle. All right, but regardless, mean arterial pressure is calculated as two thirds diastolic blood pressure plus one third systolic blood pressure. Below 120 over below 80 is normal blood pressure. Once you get above that, um, you start getting into categories where um, it's no longer considered normal, and at some point in time, you are classified as hypertensive. Now, this recently changed um, so that the new classification um, as of today, this is uh, July 2018. The classification currently is greater than 130 over greater than 80. It doesn't have to be either, both those numbers. It can be 130 or the 80 that you are, are surpassing. Um, so if your blood pressure is 132 over 78, you're hypertensive. Likewise, if you are 110 over 82, you're hypertensive. All right, so it doesn't have to be both numbers, but it can be both numbers that are greater than these thresholds. If you're in that range, you are now considered hypertensive. Again, that's that's changed recently what those thresholds are. All right, so hypertension is a very, very common uh, disorder. And it's with the new classification, it's actually the thresholds have come down quite a bit. And so many, many more people are going to be diagnosed with hypertension, especially young people who didn't used to be diagnosed with uh, hypertension. They used to be called prehypertensive. Now, because of the change in the classification, a lot of them are going to be hypertensive now. All right. So if we try to look at the reason for the uh, the person has hypertension, most people with hypertension have what we call primary or essential hypertension. And basically all this means is we don't know the cause. It is idiopathic. All right, so we have no idea why they're hypertensive. They just are. And so that's about 90% of the people. About 10% of the people, so a very small fraction of them, have what we call secondary hypertension. This is when we know the cause of their hypertension, and oftentimes you can treat that uh, issue, and then the hypertension can go away. All right, so maybe they have some sort of weird, ab weird abnormality in one of their kidneys or both their kidneys. Uh, maybe there's a narrowing of a blood vessel somewhere that's uh, going to affect how blood pressure is sensed by the body, and then that can cause hypertension. So if you fix that issue, 
secondary hypertension oftentimes will go away. All right, but again, most people are, have primary or central hypertension where we don't know the cause and we just treat the hypertension and hope that they don't develop uh, worsened cardiovascular health. The reason why we treat hypertension is it can lead to all kinds of issues. All right, so it can lead to left ventricular hypertrophy, and this is pathological hypertrophy, not good, healthy, athletic style hypertrophy. So this is thickening of the um, walls of the heart to the point where it starts affecting the heart's ability to accept and expel blood. Uh, it can also lead to atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis, which is the hardening of the arteries that uh, starts with a buildup of fatty tissue and plaque. Um, and this can lead to heart attacks and strokes, which is listed down here. Uh, hypertension can also lead to kidney uh, kidney damage and kidney disease, and all these things have the possibility of leading to uh, death. So these are obviously very bad things you want to avoid. So controlling your blood pressure and making sure you're not hypotensive is definitely something you should be worried or you should be concerned about. Maybe not worried about, but you should be at least um, putting some effort into controlling your blood pressure. Blood pressure um, is again typically measured in the brachial artery. So in this diagram here, we have uh, various uh, places along the vascular network and what the pressure is um, at those places. So we have the left ventricle, the arteries, and the um, brachial artery would be in this range here. We have the arterioles, which is the next smaller down uh, uh, par part of the arterial network. And this is where we have the ability to constrict. So remember, these are resistance vessels here. We have capillaries, which is where all the exchange takes place. We have the venules and then the veins, which are the uh, capacitance vessels. So remember, two-thirds of the blood that's in the body is typically in the veins, and that can be uh, adjusted uh, as needed to get more blood into the arterial network. And then we're back to the heart and to the right atrium, which is your receiving chamber. So if we look at the pressure and how it sort of goes down as you get along this vascular network. Uh, so in the ventricle, when there is systole, so these peaks here, so when the heart is contracted or when the ventricle is contracted, you have these very, very high peaks here, which is very similar to what you would see in like the brachial artery. So again, if your blood pressure is 120 over 80, it'd be about 120 during the systole uh, periods during in the ventricles. The difference between the ventricles and the arteries is the diastolic blood pressure. So they both have about the same systolic blood pressure. It's the, whatever the pressure generated by the heart is. When the heart relaxes, the arteries don't completely lose their pressure. Again, they have that diastolic pressure. There's still blood pushing out against the walls of the heart or against the walls of the arteries. In the heart, though, where the uh, ventricle relaxes and sort of expands and it actually has some suction compared to the top of the heart, you're going to see it drops not to zero, but pretty close to zero. And that's what's going to allow it to sort of suck in some of the blood from the atriums, which if you look over here at the atriums, it's a little bit higher than at least the, the systolic periods are a little bit higher than the diastolic periods over here. And that's important to make sure the blood keeps moving. And so Again, the arteries, now we have systolic blood pressure and what we really considered diastolic blood pressure. Um, then when we get into the arterioles, the smaller and smaller they get, the more the blood pressure signal starts to sort of wane and drop. Um, when we get into the capillaries, yeah, most of the pulsatility is gone. If you were to zoom in on this really, really close, you would still see pulsatility. And what I mean by pulsatility is this up and down zigzag pattern from the systolic, diastolic, systolic, diastolic. So you'd still see that, but it's really, really small in the capillaries. And then when you get to the, the capacitance vessels, most of this pulsatility goes away. In some people, in some vessels, especially when their blood's really pumping, you'll still see some pulsatility, but it's not nearly as much as it is, as it is in the arteries. So it's much more smooth in it. Notice though that the pressure just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping all the way into the right atrium which has the ability to contract and it has its own cysteine diastole, right? So that's why we have these peaks back again. All right, so it's important though that this pressure does keep dropping because we always are going to push blood from uh, an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure, right? So if we have high pressure here and low pressure here, that means blood's gonna constantly 
go in the correct direction, which is in this rightward direction here. Um, so we need this slow decay of blood pressure. It's important. This is healthy. This is exactly what you want. And then back when we get to the heart again, back to the right atrium, we need an, uh, now this uh, pulsatility back so that we can pump blood during the, uh, the uh, atrial systole into the ventricles during the ventricular diastole. All right, so this is just a big loop. So this line would continue right here. All right, so let's go back to talking about mean arterial pressure here. So again, mean arterial pressure was two-thirds uh, diastole plus one-third systole, but there are other ways to calculate it, and these other ways are going to allow you to combine uh, uh, cardiovascular concepts. So mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. All right, so let's talk about each of these quickly. Cardiac output we've already defined in section two. Um, it is... Uh, result of heart rate times stroke volume. So if heart rate goes up or stroke volume goes up, cardiac output is going to go up. And if cardiac output goes up, mean arterial pressure is going to go up. All right, so again, mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance or TPR as I'll typically call it. TPR is increased when you have vasoconstriction or an increase in blood viscosity. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about this in a little more detail later, but vasoconstriction is really what we normally experience. Um, so it's when your artery or your uh, specifically your arterioles go from this large shape to a smaller constricted version of themselves, and that's going to increase the resistance. So it's going to make it harder for blood to go through there. That's going to increase total peripheral resistance or TBR, and that's going to cause an increase in blood pressure. So specifically mean arterial pressure. All right, so let's talk about, um, we'll come back to that topic later, but let's talk about the control of blood pressure. All right, so on the short term, so moment to moment, second to second, you know, heartbeat to heartbeat, blood pressure is controlled primarily by the nervous system, and that is primarily uh, through what's called the bare reflex. All right, so the bare reflex is these uh, stretch-sensitive uh, neurons, sensory neurons that are in the carotid, bodies of the uh, carotid arteries in the neck and the aortic arch in the aortic arch coming out of the heart, so in the aorta. Um, so these this, so these bare receptors are going to send a signal back to the brain and it's going to interact with the sympathetic nervous system causing uh, constriction or dilation depending on what's going on with the bare receptors. So if we have an increase in blood pressure, that's going to lead to a decrease in the sympathetic nervous system activity, and we're going to have then a decrease in blood pressure that follows. On the other side of things, if we have a decrease in blood pressure, we're going to have an increase in sympathetic nervous system activity, and that's going to then lead to an increase in blood pressure. And again, this is all through the bare receptors in the bare reflex. All right, so the next couple slides are going to talk about this in more detail, so let's just go ahead and get to those. All right, so here is your blood pressure. It's going back and forth, back and forth, like you just saw, and it's going around this line here, which is called the operating point. All right, so the operating point is what your body wants blood pressure to be. Specifically, it's what your brain wants blood pressure to be. All right, so as long as you are close to this line, your blood pressure is going to uh, be very well controlled. And again, it's going to have this oscillation around it because it's what we call a negative feedback loop. So when it gets too low, it comes up. If it gets too high, it goes back down. All right. And so let's say for a moment, for uh, example here, blood pressure is too high at the moment. When blood pressure is too high, what that's going to do is that's going to be sensed by those bare receptors we just talked about. And so what the bare receptors are, though, just again to reiterate this, these are stretch-sensitive uh, sensory neurons. So if here is the cross-section of your aorta, so your aortic arch, or even your carotid, sinus, or carotid uh, bodies here in your carotid arteries, so this is your aorta, your uh, bare receptors are in and in, intertwined into that. So if the aorta stretches the bare receptors are going to stretch too. So that's how they are sensitive to this increase in pressure. Because remember, pressure is just how much outward force the blood is applying. So if there's more outward force, there's more stretch, the bare receptors are going to be stretched too. 
that's gonna the baroreceptors are gonna send their signal up to the brainstem. Uh, we have some specific locations here. You don't need to know these for most uh, situations, but just so you know what they stand for. NTS is the nucleus tractus solitarius. CVLM is the caudal ventral lateral medulla. The RBLM is the rostral ventral lateral medulla. And so baroreceptors send their signal to the nucleus tractus solitarius, which sends a signal to the caudal ventral caudal ventral lateral medulla and that sends an inhibitory signal to the res, uh, rostral ventral lateral medulla the rvlm again you don't necessarily need to know these three here to uh, at least not for my class or for most other situations but that's then that's the sites inside the brainstem if you want to know them all right so the rostral ventral lateral medulla the importance of it is it controls sympathetic activity so it's going to get this inhibition, so this inhibitory signal, this signal to say slow down essentially, and it's going to decrease the sympathetic activity out to the body. So it's going to decrease sympathetic drive. That's going to decrease peripheral resistance. It's going to allow the blood vessels in the body to dilate a little bit, and that's going to lead to a decrease in blood pressure. So we're back down to this lower level. So again, that's the reason why we have this oscillating pattern around the operating point that's done by the barrier receptors. So when the blood pressure is too high, we go through this cycle and we decrease sympathetic activity. When the blood pressure is too low, like it might be now in this, this valley here, it's gonna go through this, this uh, reflex again. It's gonna increase sympathetic activity to increase blood pressure. And that's how the barrier receptors work. The barrier receptors are what controls blood pressure from a moment to moment basis. What controls blood pressure on a long-term basis? So there is some role of the baroreceptors and of the nervous system. Um, it's being appreciated more and more as time goes on, but the primary controllers of long-term blood pressure regulation is thought to be the kidney. We're not gonna go into a lot of detail here. Um, this is gonna be, essentially the kidneys have um, the ability to sense pressure and if the pressure is too low, it is going to release uh, renin, which is gonna initiate the renin aldosterone angiotensin system. Uh, shorthand for that is the ROS uh, pathway. So the ROS uh, hormones are gonna increase and all those hormones that are in this pathway have the effect of increasing blood pressure by causing constriction of blood vessels around the body. It also can uh, main, uh, retain sodium, so you're not urinating out a lot of sodium or a lot of water, and so you can increase blood volume that way too. So you can increase blood volume and cause constriction. Both of those are going to increase blood pressure. All right, so let's talk now about, so that was how blood pressure is controlled. Let's talk about what happens with blood pressure when you exercise. All right, so we have uh, the oxygen consumption here, so 100% would be working at your VO2 max, so your absolute the highest level of aerobic exercise intensity and then we have rest so we have the the two extremes here all right and then we have blood pressure on the uh, y-axis so systolic blood pressure is the red line diastolic blood pressure is the green line and the mean arterial pressure the the one in this situation is calculated is the dotted line in between all right so when you increase exercise intensity so increasing aerobic exercise intensity specifically you're going to have a linear increase in systolic blood pressure and this is going to be primarily because stroke volume is going to increase as well all right so systolic blood pressure is primarily linked to stroke volume when you increase exercise aerobic again aerobic exercise intensity this is a very different thing if we were talking about resistance type exercise so if you're increasing aerobic exercise intensity diastolic blood pressure doesn't tend to change a lot some people it goes up a little bit some people come down a little bit some people it stays completely flat like what's being shown here but if you were to average across lots of people you'd see it basically stays flat so it doesn't really change much at all and so the reason for this is diastolic blood pressure is primarily tied to total peripheral resistance, um, which we'll talk about maybe later, um, why total peripheral resistance or TPR doesn't change a whole lot um, during aerobic exercise. But because mean arterial pressure is the calculation between systolic and diastolic blood pressure, if systolic blood pressure is going up and diastolic blood pressure is not changing, you're gonna have an increase in mean arterial pressure 
again, driven by that systolic blood pressure. One other quick definition I want to hit here on this uh, screen before we move on is something called the rate pressure product. And this has other names, the double products, another common name for this. And all it is is heart rate times systolic blood pressure. All right. And what this is, is an indicator of how hard the heart is working and the amount of oxygen the heart needs in order to do that work. So the heart has to work a lot harder when it has a high heart rate or when systolic blood pressure is high, which means it's contracting really, really hard. And so both of these are nice indices of how hard the heart has to work. So if you multiply them together, you get this, um, this value called the rate pressure product that gives us some sort of idea of how much oxygen the heart needs and how hard it's working. And it's used a lot of the time in say like a cardiac rehab situation where somebody has cardiac issues, so heart issues, and they're being exercised and they need to stay below a certain level of heart work, right? So if we use this, the rate pressure product as an index of heart work, we can use that then to prescribe exercise that will be healthy and safe for that individual. So it's a very useful value for people who might have cardiac issues. All right, so this is probably a good place to go ahead and stop. Um, so we'll end this for the part three of the cardiovascular section, and we're gonna go ahead and make a part four that will finish out this section. That'll be all about how blood flow through, uh, blood flows through the body and how pressure relates to that and how it's all controlled by the pressure. All right, so if you have any questions, go ahead and put those in the comment section below, and I'll try to get back to you on those. Otherwise, please come back and watch that video. Thanks.